we've given enough time and we all run tight schedules. So, so just a quick um, administrative thing very quickly. Um, I would like to ask everybody to, um, to just switch off your video. It will make the stream a bit better for everybody. We've got a lot of people on this call. Um, and then my second uh, request is that if you do have any questions during the presentation, um, would you be so kind to type that in the chat box on the right? You can see this little chat um, icon on Teams, and then we can address those um, as we carry on. Uh, we've got quite a lot to show this morning, so so if we can keep all the questions to the end, we can uh, take them then one, one by one. So welcome, thanks for joining, thanks for um, accepting our invitation to show this presentation to you guys. And the title this morning is Some Use Cases um, from South Africa. I'll be switching off my video now as well. Cool. Um, so we got a couple of nice customers in South Africa and we thought of doing a presentation where we show a little bit of what we've been doing with some of the clients in South Africa. And my job here is to do a quick introduction to um, to Rocky and what the software entails and what we can do, etc. And then we'll hand over um, after that um, to 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 Inc. Brink from Cedo Tech. He's one of um, one of the the industry experts um, in South Africa, and he's using uh, Rocky to help him make good engineering decisions. Um, and then after that, uh, Vainon Prinsler will also do some use cases from South Africa that we've been involved in at Qfunsoft. Now, a quick introduction to Qfunsoft for those that don't know us. Um, we are the reseller um, and we are the sole reseller in, in, in South Sub-Saharan Africa for ANSYS and Rocky products. So we um, we are a team of engineers. I think we're 10 engineers currently um, and we sell the software, we do support, we do consulting, etc. We specialize in simulation. Um, right, so let's get to the Rocky presentation. Um, so first of all, Rocky is quite um, it's quite distributed worldwide. It's it's it might be might be a new dim code in, in inverted commas. Um, it's been around for 25 years. It's just been commercialized for the last eight years or so by a company called E Triple S. Um, they are a Brazilian company, and they've established a worldwide network of resellers. We are here down in, in South Africa. Um, we've got both offices in Gauteng and in Cape Town, and we we provide technical support, sales, etc., um, with this software. Uh, we've got locally a very a good footprint with the software. Um, I think I think the moment that Rocky started happening, a, a lot of engineers' minds open up to what a simulation can achieve. And we've got um, we've got a nice client list of people using the software. I must say, um, every single one of those companies on on my slide is really using Rocky extensively. Um, some of them are, are are using Rocky on a short term basis, so they lease it in when they need to have the software. And some of them own the software. They made it a strategic decision to to make this part of their design process, um, and they use it every day. Uh, we've got very good engineers in South Africa, especially those that are still in South Africa. Um, I'm always amazed by the cases that's being presented by our engineers um, and the kind of support we receive. I think we've got a very capable engineering force in South Africa and some cool companies. Hopefully, hopefully we can continue business as usual in a month or two or so. Things are a bit slow. Right. So the first the first video I ever saw of Rocky um, was this one. And let's hope that the internet uh, is quite good at everybody's side. Um, I used to deal with DIM, traditionally spherical DIM, so you had to build particles out of spheres, and it was very limited. The, the, the interface was a bit difficult to use, etc. cetera. Um, that was a long time ago. And then when I saw this in 2014, I thought, okay, so somebody is, is bringing out something new again. And that is to be able to to do real particle simulation, so you will be able to to to, um, to define particles based on shape, and not only by spheres. It makes the code a little bit com more complex, obviously. Um, but luckily, these guys from Metroplex figured it out, and they um, they bring, brought us a product, and they redeveloped the the whole solver and the interface to be a very easy um, user-friendly interface to use for them simulations. Um, 
We call it a particle simulator. It's not only purely DEM. You'll see from my presentation why we can do a whole bunch of different applications that you that isn't possible with traditional DEM. Um, and we've got also not only solid shapes, but we can do fibers, we can do shells, we can do solids. You can even go further and define your own particles, which will help you to um, to, to do some custom problems. I mean, not everything in the world is uh, is round, um, and there's some limitations to to spherical dim as well. So you can define your own particle. What you what you would typically do is you would scan in a particle with a 3D scanner. That doesn't need to be an expensive scanner. It can just be approximation, and then Rocky will um, will take that scan particle and it will reduce um, the number of facets or the number of faces on the particle down to uh, something that's very uh, efficient to compute. All right, flexible fibers is a new addition to the software. Um, we see a lot of applications in mining where uh, the material contains some big long lumps or maybe some old traditional poles from the mines, roof poles, etc. We'll see some examples today. And then these particles come in very handy because you can imagine if you had to define a fiber with, uh, with, with spheres, how many of those spheres will be there. And I don't know exactly how accurate that would be. Um, here's some other examples of flexible fibers. We can have multi-branched fibers as well, where you can um, define all kinds of shapes. The nice thing about a fiber particle, it's basically a beam element with some nodes in between. So that computes very fast and we're able to do very accurate simulations using these fibers. All right, this is a very quick slide. Um, I think I can talk for two hours bit, uh, about the difference between traditional um, a spherical dim and what Rocky does today. Um, but I think you can imagine if you if you're looking at any typical mining or material handling application um, to be able to pre represent those particles with spheres in some cases works very well. I mean, if you have a kind of round shaped particles, you'll get you'll get some accuracy. Um, but if you've got a real particle, then the material calibration test you have to do is so much less because if you've got a long slabby material, um, with, and you can measure the friction coefficient of that, you can do the angle of repose test, then um, that's basically all you need to do to, to, to represent the movement of the particles and the interaction. Where if you've got a, a spherical thing, you need to do a lot of calibration to make that, that particle act like a real shape. The other thing with spherical glued spheres or with a code that's bound to spherical them, is um, it's difficult to do breakage because uh, you have to define the new broken particle also with spheres. Makes it a bit difficult. Um, and then the moment that the aspect ratio is becoming large, like in the case of coins or very flat slatted material, um, the friction is very inaccurate if you have to do spheres because the, the contact area there is not really accurate. Right, we can obviously then with real particles, can we can do particle breakage and fragmentation. Um, there's some calibration tests you can do to do this. Um, I've got a video in the latest slide that I'm showing a little bit of that. Um, we've got some cases in South Africa by IMS Engineering. There was an engineer there that did some cone crushing um, research with Rocky, and it performed very well. The, the results were, 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 were very accurate with minimal calibration tests. Here's the test I was talking about. So you'll break a particle with a steel ball. You'll count the fragments and you'll do the same test in Rocky and then you will um, adjust some factors to, to, to make sure that you get the same answer. Um, with calibration, very quickly I want to say something about calibration um, tests is that um, some in every sim simulation problem, I, I suppose, with answers or Rocky, wherever, um, you can get a very academic accurate answer by making everything very, all the mesh fine and all the parameters very close. But we must remember that we are still engineers. So sometimes when you are evaluating different designs, it's 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 a very good approach to do a rough mesh or a rough particle size distribution, get a good trend setting before you run that final simulation, right? Um, we all are still engineers and these are all tools to make good engineering decisions. Um, but the accuracy can be extremely accurate. Um, depending on what your application is and how you set it up. 
All right. Um, there's, there's really nice and useful post-processing tools avail available. Uh, we've got uh, very cool clients in the mill industry in South Africa. Um, we've recently done um, a CFD DEM coupling, which we will show later in Bayon's presentation. Um, and we, we can we can plot particle energy spectra for continuous braking processes like um, grinding mills, etc. Um, you can also do contact-based energy spectra, um, number of collisions, collision frequency. The post process is very powerful. I don't want to go too much in detail with this today because we uh, we've got limited time. Um, the other big advantage of doing real particle simulation um, is that you can start looking at boundary collision statistics and surface wear. Um, with spheres, this is a bit more difficult to do because you have got a contact area with a sphere to a, to a boundary where this will also represent um, some more of the, of, the, of the flat interactions between the particles. And this is st a stock standard in Rocky. It's very easy to plot these wear surface areas and look at where your high wear areas would be. We could also do intra-particle collision statistics. Um, so in some industries where the particles will degrade due to, um, due to the mixing and the collisions between them, you would be able to predict how the particles will be. In the pharmaceutical industry, this is very useful to see the degradation of the, of the tablets. Um, and it will show you exactly what the final shape will be. We've done some very accurate things with some local companies on some wear simulations. This is just another example of, um, of real particle simulation. Um, this will be very difficult to do only with spheres and traditional DEM. It will also take very long to solve. Um, we, with this, with, with Rocky, we can, we can do predict that um, uh, intra-particle collision statistics very, very accurately. All right, we can also add a thermal property to particles. So we can do thermal simulations where the cooling down of particles, etc., will be considered. This is where you give the particle a temperature and it will cool down or it will heat up, depending on what the, the different particle uh, thermal properties are. Um, there's also applications where we couple this with CFD so that we can look at the effects of heated air, um, fluids running through uh, the particles, etc. That can also be done. All right, this is just a very um, cool example of a convex particle. Um, it's a very large problem. All right, and then I quickly want to say something about the solving time of these simulations. Now, traditionally, simulation time was very long on them. It was all C CPU based. So what the AAAS did and what Rocky did is that they, they customized the solver to run on GPU technology. Now, on the left there on my screen, you can see this is a sample problem that um, that, that was solved on, on different hardware. If you had to solve that problem on eight cores of CPU, so that's a general um, eight core machine uh, workstation that you get, that problem was solving in 92 hours. And if you go up to a, um, a Titan Z card, you can solve that in 4.9 hours. And if you go to the high-end GPU cards, you can solve that problem in 2.7 hours. So, so the effect of this in industry was that um, we, we were able to simulate much larger models, which challenged um, engineering a little bit. And we started doing um, multiple transfer points. You'll see some apl applications today as well. Um, you can also do multi-GPU. So you can you can put a number of GPUs together. The second graph there shows the uh, expected feed up between a uh, speed up between uh, one GPU, two, three, and four GPUs, and it also shows the number of particles. So so for for multi GPU problems, you need to have a large um, a problem with a lot of particles to really see a big scale up between one and four. Um, if the particles are or not so much, and it fits into the memory of one GPU, that will be more efficient um, than the communication link between these two GPU cards. Um, all right, you can do discrete and continuum representations. Um, it will help you to convince customers and uh, and seniors about design changes you want to want to want to have. Makes it very easy to understand 
um, all the data that you um, have extracted from the simulation. The other very cool thing about Rocky is you don't need an external multi-body dynamics simula uh, simulation tool to be able to do um, multi-body dynamics um, or multi-body mo motion rather. Um, that's built inside Rocky. You can also script and define uh, many, many movements. Uh, there's the API where you can script your own things. There's an example from We Are Minerals today where um, we did some scripting to represent um, uh, a jaw crush's movement specifically um, very accurately. Worked out very, very well. Uh, here's some more examples. There's a spring loaded uh, open at the bottom. Um, and then we have a free body motion in this where it will follow the trajectory based on, on what you can do. Right. Um, here we've got particle shape breakage and multi body motion combined. That will break the particles. You can see this this conical wheel is actually moving up and down as it um, is a spring defined to it. At the moment it sees the, the particle. These are very complex problems to do in the past. It's it's easy now to do it in a, in the modern uh, Rocky software or simulation software. I think young engineers will never um, have the opportunity to appreciate what we went through about 15 years ago when we tried to do simulations. <laughs> it advanced quite a lot. All right, the GUI is very user friendly. Um, if you if you are if you want a uh, a demonstration of the software. Uh, we can set up a separate meeting for that where we show you what the interface looks like. And then um, there's a very tight integration between ANSYS and Rocky tools. So if you own an ANSYS license, there, there are some guys on the call today that, that does this. Um, you are able to, uh, to couple these um, simulations very strongly. And you can do one DEM iteration, one CFD or one FEM iteration and do some transient analysis in this fashion. There will be some uh, examples. Then you can also couple with ANSYS Design Explorer. So if you need to optimize designs, you can start by um, by using ANSYS Design Explorer um, for for optimization studies. There's also mechanical coupling. That this means that instead of just looking at where the particles are going and looking at some shear forces and contact forces, you're also able to tr to to um, transfer those loads transiently from the DEM simulation to the FEA simulation. Um, and that gives us a lot of information, like for example, big rocks falling on vibrating screens. Um, and it will obviously improve your product. This is one of the, the, the best videos I've seen um, lately. It's a new f feature, obviously, to transfer those loads transiently. Um, this was very good, difficult to do a couple of years ago. Um, this is now built in in Rock and ANSYS and you can do transient coupling between the two so you can look at the real stress and the impact forces that your um, equipment will see during operation this is a cfd coupling problem we'll we, we've got some cool ones this is just the fluidized bed um, on the left is an example the separator that separates uh, light particles from heavy ones by using a stream of air traveling up that tube So just to summarize all of this very quickly, so, so Rocky is, um, is, is really a comprehensive solution for material handling uh, design and solutions where you don't need any other external software to be able to do this. Um, this is a very cool example of a Rocky Fluent two-way coupling on the right with liquid. And on the left-hand side, we've got a Rocky uh, simulation without any liquid. We've got a very cool example today. We'll show the effects of the actual slurry inside the mill. This is a very cool example of a coffee roasting machine coupled with CFD. Right, this will talk a little bit about how we do this. I'll leave this up uh, for Vaynant later in the presentation. And guys, that's the end of my presentation. I want to switch to, um, I want to switch to, to, to uh, ink. So just a quick introduction, Ink Brink um, has been in the material handling industry for a number of years. I think, Ink, you can say something um, yourself about what you want to do there. <laughs> um, 
But I'm going to hand it over to Henk for his presentation, some use cases from, from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Isak, and thanks for the introduction. Yes, my name is Henk Brink. Um, can, can everybody hear me, Isak? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Very clear, very clear. Thank you. 100%. Uh, I don't have a extremely good internet connection on this side, so uh, bear with me. I'm going to go through my slides fairly, fairly slowly, and um, also you might find a, a little bit of hesitation on the video clips, but um, we've tested them before, so uh, it should, should be all fine. Yes, so I'm basically a consultant in the materials handling industry. I've been using Rocky for the last four to five years in, in assisting me in designing transfer shoots. Um, I'm essentially a materials handling engineer doing conveyor designs, but I've evolved into doing transfer shoots uh, purely because that's where the majority of the problems actually lie on, on materials handling systems. That's the actual material flow, the transfer from one conveyor to another or either in bins and silos and so forth. So today I just want to share with you actually a very elementary and, and, and simple, um, let me just uh, share quickly here. I, I consider this as a, a relatively elementary and simple design, but we've, we've added something quite novel to it and uh, which, which I find we, Rocky really assisted us in, in, in checking certain sort of uncharted un uh, territories, which things that we just haven't done before with hand calculations. And um, I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, Isak, again, I'm going to ask you, can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Okay. So this is really a, a, a typical case study is to show a real everyday type of challenge uh, that we face in the mining industry and how Rocky can assist in, in solving these type of problems. Um, most of you have, are familiar with underground conditions. Um, the photographs that you see there is typically the um, roof bolt support system for supporting the strata or the hanging wall, the rock face uh, from collapsing. Uh, they play a very important role in the whole mining industry. It's by far the most common uh, method of, of supporting the starter underground, at least in coal mines, coal collieries, and, but also platinum, um, platinum I know. And unfortunately, they they also have their drawbacks in the sense that they do end up somewhere in the transfer chain of of the materials as it being mined. Um, so somewhere along the line, it's going to go through a silo and it's go, going to go through a transfer chute and. Uh, it normally ends up in a transfer chute getting stuck, and uh, the consequences are quite severe. We, we have multiple conveyors that get torn, uh, high capacity conveyors up to 4,000 tons an hour that get torn uh, because of these roof bolts that get stuck. Now, you can imagine trying to solve a problem like this with uh, hand calculations. Um, how, do you, how do you design? Where do you start uh, predicting the, the actual the actual uh, trajectory and, and motion of these long uh, rods, they are up to two meters in length. Um, so yeah, we've, we've simulated uh, this particular shoot for a client. It's, it's a two and a half thousand tons an hour, uh, they call it a luffing shoot. Uh, it's a coal application underground. Uh, there you can see an idea of what the shoots look like. It's uh, it's a pretty sizable shoot. It, it weighs about 10 tons, and and it's got a uh, 1800 wide uh, steel cord ST 3500 below that very expensive belt, probably in the order of about 3000 rand per running meter, and uh, these conveyors are up to a kilometer long. So you can imagine the costs um, associated with a belt cut. Um, never mind the, the production losses that you have. And um, typically, this is what the chute looks like. On the right-hand side there, you can see the coal exiting the, um, exiting the chute, and you've got what they call a profile 
profile plate, and it's essentially a mass flow control device which which profiles the material. So there's no slide gate or a clamshell gate or a profiling chute. This is actually a mass flow chute, so it acts like a feeder, uh, pulling, as I said, uh, between 2,500 and, and, and 3,000 tons per hour. Now, again, like I said, hand calculations can also not accurately predict the likelihood of these objects getting stuck in certain areas of the chute. So you can imagine doing all the hand calculations. So you you basically refine the chute, but never in the past have we ever really considered foreign objects and how they actually enter the chute and, and what's the likelihood of them getting stuck. Now, what, what we've done with this particular shoot, in addition to just doing the flow optimization, now this particular shoot had a problem. It didn't uh, achieve the, the desired capacity. But in addition to that, we decided to, to add some, some sort of lookalike, roof bolt lookalike objects. And um, we found Rocky actually very, very user friendly in this sense, because essentially what I did is I just selected a cylindrical particle and I, this is literally a, a, a few second operation, I just elongated the particle, so the, uh, the width length ratio, I just changed that and and voila, I created a, a roof bolt, typically a 50 millimeter long roof bolt, anything between 1.5 2 meters long and I entered them at a specific density, of course then a steel as a separate particle and I've entered them. As you can see there at the top image, um, obviously we accelerated the process. We, we don't normally get that amount of, of roof bolts through, but um, yeah, we've, we've put in a few tons per hour there just to, just to see what it's gonna look like going through that chute. All right, next one. Okay, so this is what the actual simulation showed us. And uh, the client was also very interested in seeing this. For the first time, they actually had an idea how this, these roof bolts actually behave through the chute. And, and also to show them, as, as you see, can see on the right-hand side, the, the arrow there, you can see these rods getting stuck in the front of that chute. And um, hindsight's perfect because you can look at it and you say, you know, wow, we should, we should have, we should have, Pick that up during the design. The fact of the matter is we didn't uh, because we did hand calculations and <clears throat> there you can clearly see, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the high likelihood of these objects getting stuck there. We, we've just created a perfect little catchment area, if you can call it that. Um, this one is a, hopefully a better image, just showing again the high likelihood of the material or, or the roof bolts getting stuck in the front of that chute. Now you can imagine that roof bolt there and how easily that roof bolt can, with the bottom section, penetrate the belt downwards through the steel cords and then causing a longitudinal rip of, of hundreds of meters on these uh, conveyor belts. So just a video clip. Now this one may hang a little bit. I've just started it now. This basically just shows the motion there. You can actually see the rods coming down and getting stuck. A few of them slowly being released at the bottom end and getting through, but there's at least three getting stuck in a position there which not only potentially can cut the belt, but also throttles the actual throughput of this, this chute. And that was actually one of the problems. The client didn't, didn't achieve the required throughput. <clears throat> Isak, just a question. Did you see that video? Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much, Inc. Okay. All right. So, so essentially, we went back to the drawing board and we modified uh, the bottom section of this particular chute um, obviously, this this was done um, through, through a certain uh, iteration process to to go back and 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 do some changes. But this is the final design that we ended up with. So we removed the front section of the chute completely. We devised a flow control gate, which uh, um, a proportional gate, which is situated at a different location on the chute. 
And um, yeah, so essentially the, the whole geometry of the bottom of the chute was changed. Firstly, to achieve the required throughput, but then secondly, also to to look at and investigate how the actual uh, roof bolts will will behave through this this uh, modified chute. And essentially, this is just a static shot uh, that we put in. There you can actually see how much better the the likelihood of, is of, of this roof bolt getting through the chute without uh, being obstructed and secondly without creating a, a motion which is even indicative of trying to cut the belt. In other words, it's, it virtually slides on, on, on the material through the chute. Now incidentally, what would typically happen here is we would have another set of magnets at a, at, at a, a further point downstream on this conveyor to actually pick up these roof bolts. And just a video clip of that one. So there you can see the filling of, of the chute. There we throw in a couple of rods. These rods are actually even longer than the previous one. The client asked us to put in two meter long rods. The previous slide was only with 1.5 meter long rods. Um, so this is really an extreme case. Um, this is the longest roof bolts that they are using. And there you can see the, the roof bolts coming through. A little bit of hesitation through, changes color to, to blue. So it gets stuck a little bit and then it's gently guided by the material again further back. There should be a few coming now. I've uh, just Pause them a little bit there at the interaction. So there we zoom in to that particular one. What is encouraging there is the whole sh way that the roof bolt is actually sliding and not, not getting lodged at any particular point in time. So obviously we did quite a few of these tests to show the client that uh, of course it's not it's not a 100%, nothing is 100% proof, but this, the likelihood is, is probably to a factor of 0.01% um, of getting stuck versus the, the previous shoot. So yeah, <clears throat> just to summarize, this is really an elementary type of, of DEM simulation and it, it hardly shows all the, <clears throat> the features of, of Rocky, but uh, I thought it necessary to just share it with you because of how <clears throat> these type of simple changes and, and, and default particle shapes that Rocky allows you, as I've said, there is a really an easy introduction of foreign objects such as roof bolts. So it changes our mindset slightly as to how to do DEMS. <clears throat> Instead of just throwing in material all the, and, and, and all, all the things that we know that we should be doing, it actually opens up a new window for us in saying, well, you know, there's, there's other things that we can do. We can actually throw in all the big rocks and the and the foreign material. So, uh, yeah, to summarize, um, the DEM simulations assist both the designer and the end client in designing and selecting optimal designs for, for mining operations. Mm. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Hank. Thanks for presenting all your lovely cases always. I think you are one of the guys that sees that sees the uh, all the design flaws in industry the most. So, so it's very cool to see these interesting things. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Please. Asking, asking Vainant. So Vainant is our uh, Vainant is our our, our um, engineer at Kufensoft, and he's been using the, the software quite extensively. Um, so he's going to present a couple of cases from our clients. Um, we've got consent from them to present them. Um, so please, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat and we can take them um, later. Reynand, all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Isaac. Okay, guys, before I share my screen here, let me just give you a quick way so that you can put a face to the voice even if you haven't met me yet. Thanks a lot, um, Enk and Isaac, for the presentation. So I'm going to quickly do a, a final presentation for us here. I'm going to try to keep it relatively short so that we can have a bit of discussion afterwards. Um, if you guys have any questions, but I'm just going to present, excuse me, a couple of case studies studies from from our clients that we did in conjunction with our clients, just to showcase um, some additional things that you can do with Rocky, and hopefully show you the versatility of the product that 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 it has with dealing in bulk material handling problems. Okay, so 
can everyone share my see my screen? Isaac, is it up and and working and so on? Can I continue? Yes, absolutely. Okay. It's perfect. perfect. Okay, guys. So let's. The first case study that I want to discuss here is one that we did in conjunction with Weir Minerals, um, along with Jakob Kotze, who is a, a engineer there at Weir Minerals, and the the problem that we were trying to address with this this process along with them is simulating a system that has a jaw crusher inaccurately. Now, overall, the simulation of the system in and of itself wasn't really a big issue. But when we talk about the jaw crusher specifically, firstly, there's breakage, which can be quite a complex thing to simulate accurately. And then there is the complexity of the jaw crusher motion itself. Now, in this case, Yaku Kotze, we were working with from Weir's side has done a lot of breakage and crushing simulations with Rocky in the past. So here he, he added a lot of value and we could very easily set up the breakage parameters inside of Rocky to give us representative crushing of the particles in the jaw without much of an issue. So the, the big focus of the process for us was getting the jaw crusher motion correct. Now jaw crusher motion is actually quite a complex four link four linkage uh, motion system that can give you quite quite an interesting motion profile and it's not as i thought initially when we started the system just a simple pendulum motion okay so so when we started the system just to quantify for ourselves what this motion actually looks looks like we set up the four linkage system inside of of ansys rigid body dynamics just to get an idea of what this um this motion looks like. And I've actually made a couple of videos just to show you the complexity of this motion. So when we look at our moving jaw, the four linkage motion system works in such a way that for different points on this jaw, we actually get widely different behaviors. So if you were to look at, for instance, a point in the middle of the jaw, you get a very ellipsoid motion there. But if you look at the motion at the, the tip of the, the moving jaw, you get a almost linear kind of circular motion area still. And this is really a very important motion to capture accurately when we want to simulate the crushing of particles in this jaw, because this motion at the tip actually quantifies the closed side setting and the open side setting for the jaw. So basically the gap size that we have as the jaw goes through its motion. And this gap size is important because this is what, what, what controls the size of the particles that the jaw crushes do. Now with Rocky's um, advanced motion kernel, it actually made it quite easy for us to set up this motion. Once we found a paper that explained the, the equations of motion for this four linkage system, we could just use a, a Python scripting API to build that into the Rocky interface for us so that we had a little macro button that we can click and then just enter the parameters for the linkages such as angles and lengths and then it automatically calculates and sets up the motion of the jaw for us so that we can exactly replicate this complex motion of the jaw. And we have a couple of videos just to show this. So this first slide is just showing a video where the particle size is shown and you can actually see the jaw and we'll rotate that around a bit. <clears throat> but we'll zoom into the jaw on the next slide. And some of the benefits that we get from this is firstly, yes, of course, we can now see are we actually breaking the particles down to a correct size? Is the flow in our system going to work properly? Or are we going to get too much buildup in the jaw itself? But we can also go into a bit more detail on the jaw surface and, for instance, plot shear power on the, the jaw itself to see how it is likely to wear and to see if there's going to be preferential wear. In this case, it's relatively well distributed, but if we were to look at this plot and see on the one side, for instance, we've got a what, much higher wear profile, then we can determine that our upstream system might be feeding preferentially and that we need to change that and so forth. And we can also look at more direct results on the particles themselves, such as, for instance, the maximum normal force that a particle experiences during this motion. And here we can actually nicely see in this video how the larger particles enter at the top and they start making their way through experiencing these force impulses until they eventually break and fall down through the bottom of the screen. So with, with the, the motion capabilities in Rocky and the, the capability of doing crushing accurately, it was really straightforward to set up this problem once we understood the motion of the jaw itself. And it allows us to accurately simulate this process. Another thing just to mention here is when we are doing breakage and crushing inside of Rocky, the particles themselves, let me just replay this video as we talk through, the particles themselves don't have just a single breakage value. 
they have a probability of breakage. So as a particle moves through the system and it experiences energy above a certain value, the probability that pot that, that particle will break becomes higher and higher. So we're almost simulating that effect of particle cracking and cracking and eventually crushing through. So that is captured within the breakage model that is built into Rocky. Okay, so that was the, the, the jaw crusher that we, that we did along with Weir Minerals. The next example is a project that we did along with Magatal. Now, Magatal, uh, along other things, they, they manufacture grinding media particles for mills. So basically the steel balls that get into um, ball mills. And when they quantify the test to determine if these steel particles or these steel balls are strong enough, what they've traditionally done is basically do a hand calculation based on how far they estimate the particle would fall in the mill from where it was lifted to where it would hit a liner again. From that, they calculate the uh, impact velocity and they calculate uh, uh, impact energy that then gets used in the tests or the physical test to see if these, these balls are strong enough. And they approached us with, with the idea of doing a DEM simulation to actually just validate these hand calculations. Because as I mentioned, the hand calculation takes into account the distance the particle falls from being lifted to the, to the mill lifters, so the boundary on the other side. They disregard the actual bed of particles, and also they disregard the, the energy dissipation that this bed of particles can give. Okay, so when we started this process, we decided to do a DEM simulation to really calculate the true impact energy that a particle would see when it hits this bed of particles. But we also decided to do a DEM CFD coupled simulation because, of course, the presence of the slurry should further dampen out that energy or should further dissipate this impact energy. So we quite easily set up the mill simulation inside of Rocky. Rocky allows us to do a slice of a mill so we can reduce the problem size quite substantially and we were able to set up a mill simulation that solves within an hour or two. And from that initial BIM only mill simulation we could see that where they had a hand calculation of 125 joules for the impact energy, the Rocky simulation only showed that the particle would experience 47 joules of impact energy. So it's a substantial amount less that the particles would see in reality, which actually showed them that they are overestimating by far for their experimental testings and most likely failing a lot of these particles that would actually have worked quite well in the mill. But as I mentioned, we wanted to take that one step further where we actually take the, the slurry effect into account as well. So we also did a Rocky CFD or Rocky Answers Fluent Coupled Simulation where we had a two-way coupling where the flow of the particles affect the flow of the CFD and the flow of the the fluid also affects the particles. And in that case, with the presence of, presence of the slurry, we found that the impact energy would further be reduced to 21 joules. Okay, so the true impact energy that these particles would see in the mill, based on our simulations, would be 21 joules, where the hand calculations that they are currently used for the experimental test was 125 joules. Okay, so a substantial amount higher. The other thing that we did find for this specific DEM CFD simulation was that there's actually a very significant influence in the trajectory that the particles follow in the mill if we account for the slurry along with the particles. So I'm just going to show that in the next couple of images and videos. Okay, so here on the left hand side, we have the trajectories calculated by Rocky in a standalone DEM simulation. So here we just have the particles in the mill, so the grinding media as well as the particles that are being crushed, and we are disregarding the effect of the, the fluid in the mill completely, and we can get a certain mill kidney and a certain particle trajectory. But as soon as we include the slurry in the system, so the water being sloshed in the mill as well, with the, the very fine particles inside of it, we can actually see a completely different trajectory for our particles, which shows us that the, the flow can have a significant effect and it should actually be taken into account when we are designing our lifters to get optimal mole behavior. And the next slide is just going to show a video of this. And, I, and with this video, you can actually see, as shown in the previous slide, where we've got this difference in the actual trajectory, but you get the semi-sloshing effect in the CFD side as well. We actually see the way the fluid affects those particles. I'm just going to play those videos once more, especially here at startup. You see this high sloshing effect that the fluid adds to those particles. So, so by coupling Rocky and ANSYS fluid, we really get the capabilities to model all the physics that are happening inside of these mills and really get accurate results and make better designs. Okay, so for our final case study, 
Unfortunately for this, we cannot disclose the client. But in this case, we had a system where we needed to simulate the underground um, transfer point between shuttle cars that were feeding material to a feeder, which had a downstream crusher. Okay, now when we started this simulation process with the client, the main concern was the fact that there was a lot of spillage from this specific feeder. But during the simulation process, we actually realized that the mass flow rate out of the feeder was substantially higher than what the downstream crusher could actually take in. So the capacity of the, of the, the mass flow out of this feeder was exceeding the capacity of the crusher, and that was actually creating a lot of fines for this client. So the focus of the simulation very quickly shifted away from how do we reduce the spillage to how do we feed this feeder with the shuttle cars to get an appropriate amount of mass flow out of the system so that we do not exceed the capacity of the downstream systems. And this type of simulation can be set up quite easily in Rocky. We can easily take a feeder, put two shuttle cars in with mass in and feed the feeder and measure the outflow. And you will see that in the video that I'll, we'll show next. But the problem or the difficulty with this specific case was that it is a highly variable process underground, right? It's not always two exact shuttle cars starting at exactly the time that are both exactly full. It can be one shuttle car or it can be two different shuttle cars feeding at an offset. And for the shuttle cars, the driver of the shuttle car decides how fast he feeds the or how fast he runs the chain conveyor on the shuttle car itself. So it's a highly variable process. And although we can do a simulation for a specific point, theoretically to capture the whole behavior, you would need to do hundreds of simulations to capture all the variability, which is obviously from a time perspective, not something that is very practical. So what we decided to do was to run a couple of simulations. And because as Isaac showed in his presentation, Rocky can couple directly with ANSYS Design Explorer, we could actually set up a numerical representation of what this feeder was going to do and then take that numerical representation, what we call a reduced order model, and make estimations of how the changes in the system would affect that outflow so that this design could be optimized and that the system could be run optimally. So just to show you, we started off with just a single point um, DEM simulation in Rocky. So we have two 20 ton shuttle cars and they are feeding with specific um, chain conveyor velocities onto a feeder which has a chain conveyor velocity of its own. So the outflow of the feeder as well as the outflow from the shuttle cars into the feeder is affected by the mass in the, each of the shuttle cars or the feeder and that velocity of that chain conveyor. So by coupling this Rocky simulation into ANSYS Design Explorer, we could run a couple of simulations. We ran about four to five simulations of each of the shuttle cars and the feeder. And then we could represent the behavior by creating a numerical response service on a continuous space. So even though we only run a couple of simulations, this response surface gives us a continuum representation of what the outflow will be given a specific mass in our feeder and a specific conveyor speed for the feeder. And the benefit of using this or setting up this model is we could now take these reduced order models into ANSYS Twin Builder and then for any velocity or mass in our shuttle cars, estimate what the outflow would be from our feeder. So here you can see me in this first setup, we only have a single shuttle car connected. I can change the velocity of the shuttle car and we can click the analyze button and within a couple of seconds, it can estimate for us what the mass in the feeder is going to be over time, as well as what the mass flow from that feeder is going to be over time. Now, since we have a numerical representation, this doesn't only have to be a constant uh, velocity. So here you can see I'm deleting the constant velocity and connecting a sine wave velocity to my shuttle car. So to test what would happen if we vary that velocity over time. And then we can see again in a couple of seconds the effect that it has on the mass flow out of the feeder and the mass in the feeder. And we can then just as easily connect a second shuttle car in. So initially we were running one shuttle car. I then connected up a second one. And instead of having a constant value, I'm just increasing that value by time. So we're making the value a function of time. And very again, very quickly again, we can just see what that effect is going to be. So within a matter of seconds, we've tested three different cases where we would in reality, I have to have done three different simulations, which have, would have made, made the system take a, a lot longer. So I hope this presentation has shown that like the customizability inside of Rocky itself, as well as the functionality of Rocky to couple directly with the tools of ANSYS, really allows us to approach a very wide range of bulk material handling problems. And it allows us to do so 
in an intelligent way that allows us to get answers out as quickly as possible to really give us an engineering tool that allows us to optimize design and to find problems with in our design in an allowable amount of time. Thanks a lot, guys. I think that's it from my side. Isaac, I'm going to pass back to you now to finish up and then maybe discuss the questions if there are any. All right. Thank you very much, Vainant. I am uh, I'm very excited about this presentation. We planned it for 30 minutes. We went up to 55. Um, thanks for everybody's patience. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat now. Um, if you want to send them later directly to us, I'll, I've left our details in the chat. Um, you'll, you can either contact info at QFinsoft, um, send the email there, or you can contact us directly. All of our emails are there. Um, and if you, the time is now, if you want to still quickly type one thing. I think a closing comment from, from my side is that um, I think times are tough. And I think things are a bit slow currently. So um, simulation will definitely start playing a bigger role in our design process. And this is a great time to do it. If you if you are curious about um, the cost of the software, how long it takes to, 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 to be trained in the software, um, we can help you with that. So just send me an email. We can have an off-site meeting and do that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henk. Uh, we've, we've, we've had a long journey um, of uh, a, a number of years with Rocky. Um, it's always good to have you with your professional presentations. And then, Vainan, thank you very much for your stuff. Um, it's really amazing to see how far we've come with this software. Thank you, guys. You must have a great Thank, thank you. Thanks for yes. all the participants. Good luck with lockdown. Don't be tied down. Just um, be locked down. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Okay, let's see.